Hi, I'm Adriana Zakharievich, coming from the University of Belgrade, Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory, currently a Gastforscherin at the Centrum für Interdisziplinäre Frauen und Geschlechtsforschung uh, here in Berlin. Um, I want to thank Frankfurter Arbeitskreis and especially Eva von Redekert for inviting me to um, say something about the notion of an individual. These days, many will remember the prophetic words of Margaret Thatcher that there is no society, only individuals. The old statement became even more pronounced when Boris Johnson himself with COVID-19 and at the moment self-isolating, contradicted a former prime minister. In his video message, as if cheering and comforting the nation, Johnson conveyed, we are going to do it, we are going to do it together. One thing I think the coronavirus crisis has already proved is that there really is such a thing as society. In various parts of the world at 8 p.m., isolated individuals join in an applause dedicated first and foremost to doctors, nurses, professionals, both on duty or those who return to duty from their retirements, and to thousands who volunteer to aid the health service. The health services, which are in many parts of the world still public or semi-public, and as the current crisis has shown, for that reason almost in the state of disrepair, became representative of the detrimental conception that there is no society. Indiscriminative of the bodies they find shelters in, viruses have, in a matter of mere two months, demonstrated the illusionary phantasmatic nature of the belief that the individual stands alone. In this lexicon series, I will present a notion of an individual which, I would argue, returned in a neoliberal guise when from the early 1980s onwards, a reconfiguration of the politics of dependence began to take place, followed by a torrid dismantling of welfareism and real socialism. The individuals of the time were called to use their freedom to self-actualize, to depend only on their own wits and capacities to deal with globalized insecurities. Government could no longer be interested in taking care of the governed. The governed needed to become more dependent on themselves and less dependent on the state in particular. It was repeated time and again that the welfare of the individuals is best secured and promoted when they are prompted to be independent, to use all their might and imagination to be the only carers for themselves. Each and every one of us, simply by being individuals, has the capacity to act autonomously, that is to demonstrate one's sovereignty over oneself through one's independence. In a word, the governed had to become self-governing again. Such reprogrammed neo-Victorian language urges us to meticulously revisit its source. The link between early liberalism and neoliberalism, at least in their shared tendency to produce strong aversion towards dependence, to correlate it with utter objection, is by no means accidental. Seen through these lenses, independence proves to be inextricable from an incessant circuit of exclusions, of systemic blockades, restrictions or obstructions of opportunities, rights and resources. But it is also closely related to a specific epistemic and normative configuration of the creature who is the bearer of independence, that is a sovereign individual who governs himself. Going back to 19th century can help us understand that this forceful discursive renewal of independence assumes a complementary re-normalization of inequality. Re-examining the early liberal vocabulary enables us to understand that being an individual is not a state or a disposition, a quality attributable to anyone and everyone. It also reminds us that it is not an empty and therefore universally applicable notion, but a notion constituted by exclusions. Being an individual assumes being embodied in a certain way and having certain qualifications. Let me, for that reason, give a common description of an individual operative and in use throughout the 19th century. 
The most encompassing definition posits the individual as the only real owner of his own persona and affairs, and the use of male gender here and elsewhere is purposeful. The ownership is founded on an owner's fundamental knowledge of his interest, agency, and capacity for autonomous representation. The definition is itself old because such self-ownership is, according to Macpherson, a key trait of the original individualism founded on a conception of the individual as essentially the proprietor of his own person or capacities, owing nothing to society for them. Society becomes a lot of free, equal individuals related to each other as proprietors of their own capacities and of what they have acquired by their exercise. Society consists of relations of exchange between proprietors. Political society becomes a calculated device for the protection of this property and for the maintenance of an orderly relation of exchange, says Macpherson. This notion clearly evokes Locke's man in the state of nature, whose freedom amounts to his being subject to nobody, an absolute lord of his own person possessions, equal to the greatest. But such a wild freedom where everyone is equally a king brings continual dangers and fears for the king's life, liberty and states, that is, his property. Being subject to nobody invokes a receding feudal historical context and the parallel emergence of an early capitalist society based on exchange. But as much as it may be true that, as Macpherson claimed, Bentham built on Hobbes, it was only in Bentham's time that the society began to function as an arena where interests converged in their almost unimpeded circulation and where it was politically expedient to enable individuals to act as agents of their own self-possession. Contrary to the previous times when sovereignty normally referred to the supreme authority of the public sword or sovereign uh, persona embodied by the monarch, the supremacy, absoluteness and indivisibility of such an authority would now belong to any individual. One of the first expressions of this transference of sovereignty comes from Bentham's moral reform and his famed principle of the greatest happiness of the greatest number, founded on a solid premise that each individual has to be given the right of self-assessment of his own interest. The demand for self-assessment countered the phantasm of persona ficta, that is, the politically representable interest of the few, the smallest number as the common interest of the whole. Unlike the previous fictive entity understood as unbreakable unit of interest of those subsumed, the greatest number was easily decomposable to a sheer arithmetical sum of the individuals who composed it. Once the right to representation of one's individual interest was recognized, the right to self-assessment turned into full sovereignty of an individual. John Stuart Mill's famous statement from his uh, uh, essay on liberty substantiates this claim, and it already transcends the mere question of the political representation, which was no longer an issue for the enfranchised middle class when he wrote that book. I quote, the only part of the conduct of anyone for which he is amenable to society is that which concerns others. In the part which merely concerns himself, his independence is of right absolute. Over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. End of quote. Not only is sovereignty here almost equatable with independence, but one such an equation, in fact, depends on an inherent capacity of an individual for self-improvement, self-betterment, and thus self-actualization. The individual is the one who constantly strives to be better than he is because he can be better than he is. Contrary to the assumed state of perfection of the smallest number, the inborn given of the privileged few, the individual is perfectible. His work, virtue, and wisdom, coupled with the relative absence of the artificial state-imposed constraints to the sphere of free circulation of interests, produce a constant striving towards self-improvement. 
As the sole owner of himself, the individual has an indivisible possession over his life and limb, as well as of his future, the movement of his life, which is what constitutes its indivisible sovereignty. The being the best judge of one's own interest, being in the rightful possession to solely assess their implementation, and being politically indivisible, is to be the one who rules over oneself without the help of others, that is, independently. Being an individual means to be endowed with certain forms of self-legislating and self-governing powers, the rational and expedient capacity for acting according to the rules not imposed from the outside, with the ability to orient oneself without the help of another in the vortex of alien interests. Finally, as the sole proprietor and the sole representative of what is properly his, an individual was a sovereign possessor of the right to privacy. As self-representable, the individual chooses which part of his privacy he would make represented or public. As self-representable, he constitutes himself as the private person who is also the owner of his privacy, which now becomes a legitimate part of his self-possession. In that sense, being an individual assumed being able to define the divisive difference between the spheres of production and reproduction between the public and the private. But who was the individual born in the 19th century? Who qualified as one? And this is by no means an idle question or such that it can be relegated to the domain of history since our bodies are also a historical set of relations. When we say that the individual is sovereign and perfectible owner of his own interests, the one who knows them and acts in accordance with them, and is therefore granted the rights to represent himself and the rights to be the sole owner of his own privacy, who are we exactly talking about? Are we talking about free laborers whose freedom amounts to dispossession at the time? whose bodies were their main and sometimes only capital, or if the lower orders were not as yet compatible with a tight, although universally applicable, definition of an individual, maybe women, at least those not belonging to lower orders, were. Women who were juridically, ontologically and politically defined and understood as part of someone else's property rather than property beings themselves throughout that self-same century when the individual was engendered. It also seems that various barbarians who in John Stuart Mill phrasing did not somehow fit. Namely, if all women were inherently devoid of the capacity to be possessors rather than possessions, while lower orders lack the capacity to pursue their own true interest in a system of free circulation of interests, then the racialized others were seen as dispossessed of the capacity to self-improve into a category of the human. They were treated as half-devil, half-child, as in Kipling's famous versing of the white man's burden. As can be seen, the 19th century embodied individual has been set upon internal stratifications and exclusions of those who were, as yet, bereft of the substance of an individual. Their bodies and specific positions in the social framework which gave birth to the individual precluded them to count as once. Within such conditions of possibility, being an individual became an entitlement for which one had to qualify. In trying to define an individual and in relaying on the liberal vocabulary revamped in the last several decades, I wanted to demonstrate that the individual is not an empty and universally applicable notion. The freedom to self-actualize, defined as a fundamentally individual exercise, which ostensibly belongs to anyone and everyone, presupposes leveling and stratifying a system of normative exclusions and institutional arrangements to accommodate differential allocation of dependence. In order for some to be independent, many will remain in a precarious state 
of relative or total dependency, for which they are again reviled, like in the Victorian times. This is in the end the consequence of the notion that there is no society. All have to fend for themselves or perish. What Corona crisis made abundantly clear is that in our self-isolation, if and when it is at all possible for us, we largely depend on many others. Nurses, bakers, pharmacists, garbage collectors, producers of toilet paper, obstetricians, plumbers, electricians, and at all times. What it also makes clear is that women around the world may indeed be safe from the virus at their homes, but are far from safe from the illusion that they are someone's possession and thus subject to gender-based violence. Finally, the barbarians of today, forgotten at the moment of a total lockdown, will resurface as the heart of the crisis once we try to get back to life as business as usual. Virus makes us all equal, as many have noticed these days, almost in surprise. That is not because we are all equally independent individuals, but because we are very embodied and are, as bodies, very much supported by various overlapping infrastructures never to be taken for granted. If virus showed something to us, it is not only that the society exists, but that we are dependent and interdependent in innumerable unchosen and probably unwanted ways. The question is, of course, if Corona crisis will teach us this lesson, that we live in a very unequal world in which only pandemics can activate the equality in death, a very sorrowful equality indeed.